that you're a programmer. Okay. Um, so, before we go over this, okay. okay. So, I want to say, I want to kind of add a couple of things here. And then we'll talk about something else. Another feature, and also connected to architectural design, which is outside the motion graphics. Okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, I mean, what we, what we talked about today is, I mean, even though we went like it's four or five layers deep, we still scratch the surface. So that's why I actually have to go write the whole book. So there's like 60 more pages uh, of stuff. I don't even remember what it is, but, uh, but, you know, but there are lots and lots of kind of other consequences uh, for our understanding of media, media history, etc., etc. So let me just kind of throw a few points, and then I want to have some time and we'll, we'll talk about another aesthetic feature and also see how the developments in design and motion graphics completely parallel what happens in uh, product design and architecture. Okay, so a few things here. Uh, so first of all, uh, the fact that the media right, can move from uh, physical material and from industry produced technology, where we two paint, right, or 35 mm cameras, uh, or printing presses, the fact that media are now implemented in software means that the media, the term the media, which I was about to get rid of, right, in fact, is actually it turns out to be uh, a very good term to talk about uh, well, talk about the media. <laughs> <laughs> Why? So I think that one way to maybe one way maybe to understand this term is to say new media is what may be different from new media to old media is that new media because it is implemented so largely in software. Of course, you have you know controllers and graphic surfaces, you know, but this is kind of software core, right? Um, especially if we're talking about you know, media in the context of culture industries and media production, cultural offering. It means that, and again, this is also not something which is, uh, has anything to do with the kind of theoretical and practical origins of computer science. I mean, we could have imagined that you know, the whole IT field would have developed in a very different way, but the way it developed over decades is that you know, because of standardization, you know, because of this compatible file, and because over time, right, Okay, let's say Photoshop and Adobe products, okay, you don't have open source, but you have always equivalent, you have GIMP, and you have Inkwell, and you have right, you know, open office, and right now there are enough, you know, right? Basically every major type of software you have pretty powerful equivalents, and then you have you know, developing the processing and so on and so forth. I mean we can go into the details, but we actually know the details, right? So I'm going to skip this. Uh, the new media is new because it's it's constantly both from a theoretical point of view, but also from a practical point of view, it's expendable. So every day, somebody designs a new plugin, this person, again, I'm sorry to stick to Photoshop, if you like, you can use you know, Pro Tools or Processing, but every day somebody writes a new plugin for Photoshop, you can extend what Photoshop can do, right? Every day somebody writes a new function or completes a new library to Processing, you extend what Processing can do. Now, I don't know how to, I don't know how to kind of graph this, Right? Because I think it would be kind of stupid to try to reduce the knowledge of the media to some kind of graph. But if, I mean, even I wouldn't do it, right? right? Even my, uh, my obsession for, let's say, uh, for, for, uh, formalization. But you can imagine some kind of hypothetical graph right? where you can say, you know, this is pi, and then this is, I don't know, some kind of function m. <laughs> Which would represent, right? Represent, let's say, the si represent the size, right, of this meta medium and all the different techniques, right, all the different possibilities for, uh, you know, expression, communication, presentation, editing, sharing, and so on, which are available. Uh, I mean, one way to think about this development is that because now everything happens in the software, and there are so many people <laughs> participating in it, you know, it's probably some kind of some kind of curve which is going up. Now, this is not to say that it's a linear linear expansion. Because of course, uh, and, and in fact, you know, the example which you, know, you told me, right, when we're going now, 
exactly good examples, but I'll just generalize it because of the reasons, for example, of competition uh, and also other reasons. Some you know people have very good ideas and they create a company or they you know they, they write something in university and then let's say they create the software and there's a larger company and they play your competition and they go to buy your company and they put your software on the shelf and you never see it again. I mean you talked about the example Alus, another example which maybe some you know, but if not, Rose's interface designed approximately in the early nineties called PET or PET plus plus which basically substituted uh, a, kind of, a kind of desktop which we have today, right? which consists from a set of overlapping windows with this three-dimensional space, and you can all of us exist in three-dimensional space, and this interface was you know, designed in the university environment, and then, I don't, I don't know, it's Microsoft or whatever, we can go to the rights, and basically, you know, we never, never see. <laughs> and another thing which I want to say, and again, this is really kind of uh, a little bit of a size, but it's important, so, you know, I sort of, you know, I periodically look at the papers in, you know, computer science or computer graphics or computer multimedia where people are defining new techniques, new algorithms. And you look at these papers and you also start looking a little bit more closely at the kind of history of computer media and the history of all these inventions. You realize that, you know, there are literally thousands and thousands of potentially very interesting ideas which maybe somebody wrote a paper and then, you know, maybe did you know, implemented some software, you know, just, just enough to write a paper. Maybe somebody made some program and then the program kind of went away and the technique disappeared. So that so it's definitely a great great simplification, right? So like any process, you know, some things over time added, some things are taken away. And then there are also things which are invented and it may take 20, 30 years for them to be realized. For example, it was already like all okay or maybe even somebody before here, but we have this idea that you can say like a whole workspace. Well, it basically only happened in the latest version of Mac OS, right? So it took about you know, 30 years. Uh, another example would be, so you know, Apple has really kind of popularized, right? Has popularized the idea of a kind of multi-touch interface. So I was lucky once to hear a lecture of some guy from Microsoft, who I think in a current lecture a couple of years ago, he was director of Microsoft Office in uh, Beijing, but he happened to work in a research lab in Microsoft, which in the kind of 90s was kind of working on this very multi-touch interface. And he told us that in fact there's this long history and then kind of went and research in the mind. It turns out, you know, like okay, this around this idea has been around for like 20, 30 years, right? Uh, so definitely, you know, definitely, you know, this, this picture which I presented of this continuous expansion, you know, it's a way to simplify. But in the same time, uh, it does seem to me like if you compare the development of software medium or software meta medium to, let's say, for example, the history of I know, sculpture or the history of painting or the history of printing, things are expanding. And also, because there are many, many more people, right, who can participate in this expansion, uh, so there's this kind of whole democratizing effect of software, uh, this process is quite different. And of course, the whole politics of open source completely kind of fundamental, right? And when you think about it, the 90s, in fact, very dominated, right? The 90s really dominated by this, uh, this commercial software from uh, Autodesk, Adobe, other companies. And by now, you know, people actually have developed, right, very far off alternatives. Although most of you who use it may also agree that sometimes, you know, you know, if you use right, open source software, well, sometimes you have to pay a certain price, right? Mm -hmm. That things may be unstable or not documented. You have to one child. Yeah, exactly. But you know, I'm, I'm, you know, but, you know I, I'll tell you one thing. Like, I, mean, so I started using this imaging. And what I realized is that you know, nobody has ever produced documentation for software, right? Which is completely comprehensive. So at some point, you do something. You said, OK, and you look at the documentation, you have no idea how it works. But if you have, if you have source, you can actually see how this feature is implemented, and then you can actually figure it out. Okay, this is just one, not the most important, but very really interesting example why open source software right, is important. And then of course there are very different reasons, right? So the whole government, the whole I think it was Brazil or some other country even like five or six years ago, we said, okay, we don't want to run, we don't want to run with closed software because our whole society, right, is going to run with software and you know we don't have control over it, so we're going to buy the software to give the source code, right? And this